by the time you finish up today, what you'll learn is that the single most productive strategy, the number one, head and shoulders above all the rest, most productive strategy is to bring members into a membership event rather than a rotary meeting. How many people have heard we got a prospect bring into a rotary meeting? I've heard that too. It works worse than we thought. <laughs> this, is, this, is not, this is not a sprint. Membership is an endurance race, and it requires attention every month, and it requires some intentional planning and some intentional event-related strategies. Um, what, what we found is, and what do you suppose that is? Why do you suppose we don't get a high conversion rate of people we bring to Rotary to experience a meeting? Because you said me. You said me. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? They don't get to learn about Rotary. Yeah, in, in the average Rotary meeting, folks, you know, we do an invocation, we pledge, we have lunch, we make some announcements, we talk about some projects. How many minutes in the average Rotary meeting are spent on learning anything about Rotary? A couple. Five, five would be a really good day. It would be a really rich day. So what happens is, prospects leave a rotary and they're not learning any more about rotary than when they came in. And what that does, folks, is it leaves the member not high and dry. It leaves the expectation that the member knows the rotary story, which they may or may not. Okay? So if you've got members out there that, that would really like to do what you're asking them to do, which is find prospects for you, if we make it too big, we make it into this huge thing, which is you got to find a prospect, you got to tell them the whole rotary story. You got to persuade them that they want to join and spend the money and do all those things and bring me a signed rotary uh, app membership application, membership proposal. Boy, that's a tall order. So what we've done in a number of clubs, including my own, is we've taken this down a notch. We've said, okay, I don't need a signed membership proposal. What I need is a prospect that's qualified to join Rotary, not just some person off the street. Somebody that meets the qualifications of being a Rotary period. And what I need you to do is I need you to bring that person to one of our upcoming Discover Rotary events. We call them Discover Rotary. This is a membership event in the, in the context of, for example, we've offered some grants to help uh, defray some of the cost leaves. So the idea is to get people to this type of a membership event. And since there seems to be widespread misunderstanding of what these events ought to look like, we thought we'd do one today for you. So I can introduce the Discover Rotary Players. <laughs> Jane Dyer, Reed Lore, Scott Stevens, Ron Devonay, and, and, and Kathy Holster. These are the Discover Rotary Players. Now, what they have in front of them, any of them that are not members, some of them are members, some of them are not, will discover who an event. I've also handed out a sign-up sheet. Okay? I've handed out a sign-up sheet because despite the fact that we had people register for this and we know who's coming, sometimes the information you get from a potential sponsor is not exactly correct. You'll also have walk-ins. You'll have people that can follow your instructions and register somebody for the meeting, but they'll show up, which you know, we gotta welcome those too. So we always hand out a sign-up sheet where we only ask for three things, name, email address, and mobile phone number. That's, it. That's all we wanna know. So we pass that around the table as soon as the group gathers up. The other thing each of them has, each of them has my Rotary business card, so they have a person to get back to. Now, presumably they can find the sponsor also. And they have a trifold, little simple trifold, Greenville Rotary brochure. Now, it doesn't have to be glossy like this. It doesn't have to have all this artwork in it. A simple one page, eight and a half by 11 fact sheet under 12, we do. But it is important, folks, that people have something to take away with them. People feel like they came to a meeting of substance if they take something home. So these are all integral pieces of making this thing work. There are a lot of moving parts, but they're not that complicated. If you'll turn to, um, first of all, tell you what's already happened before we got here. Before we got here, several things have happened. First of all, we have set up these events for the entire year, and my club does one of these a month. And you heard that my club needs 48 members 
between now and in July to make us gold. This is part of how we'll get those. And the reason we need to do one of them a month is because, again, we turn over so many members a year as a large club. So they're set up in DACTV as registration events, and that's another key important part. We do these consistently at 11 a.m., an hour before the regular meeting, on the Fort Tuesday. So if you look at the district calendar today, you'll see a Greenville Discover Rotary meeting on the fourth Tuesday of 11. And then we invite those uh, potential members to stay over for the regular meeting and have lunch with us after they learn some things about Rotary in this session. Um, we've also promoted to our members that this is the best possible way to bring somebody into the club. And that's a fact. That's because the hit ratio, would you believe, our hit ratio consistently for years out of this event is 50%. If I get four prospects into a Discover Rotary meeting, I'll end up with at least two membership proposals. If I get six or eight, wow, it's a, it's a good day. Okay, 50%. And you may notice why after we get all finished. So we've also sent memory joggers to our members and not not on occasion. There's a podium announcement every meeting of the next Discover Rotary coming up. Discover Rotary and the next upcoming date is in every email we get. Discover Rotary is promoted by a board team that is touching base with um, higher profile members and asking them personally, would you bring somebody to Discover Rotary? We have some vertical, vertical market teams looking at lawyers and engineers and contractors, et cetera, hospitality, looking for people in those uh, in those market areas that might be potential members. The whole thing is, don't worry about bringing me a, a, a membership proposal, just bring me a prospect to discover Rotary. We'll tell the story for you. So you see, that makes the, that makes the ask a lot less daunting. We really aren't asking the member to do anything except go through the Rolodex, find some qualified folks, and invite them to a one-hour event. It's not that hard. And here's also what's all already happened. The prospects have been invited, they've been confirmed, and the registered by the sponsor, the Rotarian, goes into the ACTV. Again, we've got this link in every, in every session. The Rotarian goes into the ACTV, registers the member, or registers the prospect, and we ask them for <coughs> three things, their name, their email address, and their uh, mobile phone number. So those have been entered then, either by myself or the membership chair, or perhaps our part-time person in the office. Those have been entered in that DV as potential members. This is critically important, that you keep track of your prospects, keep track of your potential members, and you've got the, the perfect platform to do that in the form of that DV. It's free, it's there, you're using it anyway. As a result of that, since they're back, then we can send them a reminder email. And I typically do that on Thursday or Friday before the Tuesday meeting. And it's the same email every time. Just a quick reminder, um, thank you for your interest in Greenville Rotary. Remember that our Greenville uh, Rotary Discover Rotary event is at 11 o'clock on Tuesday, et cetera. Please call if you have any questions. So, real simple deal. And the point of this is that, as in business processes, once you get this step in place, it's a machine. Once you get this step in place, it's just lather, rinse, repeat. You just do it the next time, kind of the way you did last time, and fix up anything that didn't work. We also send an email to the sponsor. <coughs> yes, question to that. Is it appropriate if some of the smaller clubs bring a prospect to uh, discover Rotary? You're absolutely welcome to do that, or you're welcome to sample it yourself. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking you guys have the infrastructure. You're the elephant in the room. So no problem. We, 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 do, we do make the point to discover Rotary that there are 11 clubs in Greenville County. There's something for everybody. Morning, noon, night, big, middle, small. Yeah, that's completely in balance. We, we welcome you to be able to make an appointment with you guys. Or what? Uh, just register uh, your guest to Dac TV on the, on the calendar. Or check in with one of us and we'll talk you through it. Any other questions at this point? Okay, so now I know who the guests are. I've sent them a reminder email. I also do that for the sponsors because we know who they are too, right? When we entered them as a potential member, we put, the people, we put the one in front of them in the first line as a sponsor. So if you look on page one of your binder, right behind the table of contents, 
Our time table content is based on recipes for a successful membership event. And you can literally follow along. These are the steps. This is the secret sauce. This works. So, at this point, then, we're going to uh, some dimension character here. And we'll begin the Discover Rotary meeting as it would happen an hour ahead of the Rainbow Rotary meeting. I'll sit down for this as I usually do at Discover Rotary. So I just take a seat at the table. It's a conference style table setup, just like this. And the key thing to this, folks, is not very many people. Okay? Not very many people. You can't manage a group of 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 potential Rotarians. You can manage a group of four, six, or eight. Okay, so the key thing is not very many people and do it more often. My recommendation for most clubs is do this, do something like this at a minimum four times a year. <coughs> Bigger clubs are going to need to do it every other month, six times a year. We do it every month because of the number of new members we need in the course of a year. So, appreciate all of you attending today. Uh, each of you have a brochure on the Greenville Club. And my business card, I'm Terry Weaver. I'm a past president of this club and also a past uh, district governor of uh, this part of the state of South Carolina. I'll be your host today and we'll together learn a little bit about Rotary. So uh, let's get started first with just a quick round of introductions. And if each of you will just tell me if you're a Rotarian, if you'll tell me what brought you to Rotary and what's kept you here. If you're not, let me know what prompted your interest in this meeting today. Why, why did you agree? Uh, grace us with an hour of, uh, of your time to, uh, to hear this story. So I'll start. Uh, key words, okay? Break out here for a second. If you ask a group of people to do anything like this in a round robin uh, discussion sort of thing, you go first. You know what behavior you're looking for. So these will be really quick because we've got a lot of folks in the room. Uh, again, my name is Terry Weaver. Oh, tell us also, I'm sorry, uh, a little bit about what you do when you're not a rotor, uh, either your vocation. Uh, so my name is Terry Weaver, and uh, I've downshifted my career to a part-time business coaching practice. I've uh, been part of this club for more than 20 years, and uh, that's the fourth of several Rotary clubs I joined. Uh, unlike some people, I joined Rotary because I was part of a Rotary company. Everybody from the CEO on down to the regional manager and branch manager here in Rotary, so it's just not optional. I've stayed because this is my strongest network of high quality people that I've ever had in my life in four different cities and it's still the case today in South Carolina. I'm, I've gotten a little bit out of business circulation but I get to see my friends every other Tuesday when I come visit to Rotary Public Radio. Scott? I want to welcome everyone here today. My name is Scott Stevens and I'm honored to be the president of the Rotary Club of Greenville this year and it's just an absolutely fantastic day to have you here. I just want to tell you that I've been a Rotarian for about 15 to 20 years. Uh, I've left Rotary for a couple of years, but once a Rotarian, always a Rotarian in my mind. And one of the reasons that I love Rotary is it gives you such an opportunity to give back to the community. I, I joined Rotary to network, but I quickly found out that Rotary is a way for me to have a platform to give back to the community. And I think that you'll find that out about this club. Thank you. I'm Kathy Goldson, and I have an Allstate agency in Anderson, and my accountant asked me what I was doing for my civic obligations. So I hadn't thought about that, and I thought, well, what do I need to do? And he said, well, you need to come visit our Rotary Club. You need to think about getting active in our community. So he has invited me to come, and here I am. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ron Devon, and I'm a uh, member of the Rotary Club of Greenville, and I'm a relative newbie. I mean, I hear about all these people that have been here for 10, 15, 20 years, and I've only been with Rotary for about four years. But uh, I'm new to Greenville, I've only been here 10 years, wanted to really get to know people in the community, but also wanted to get back to the community. So I retired several years ago, started a nonprofit organization, and I uh, really needed couple of things, you know, meet more people in the Greenville area, get more contacts, but also find a way to get back. And I gotta tell you, Rotary's been a great way to get back. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Chris Jones, and I'm an honorary member of the Greenville Rotary Club, and uh, also have served as a past president of my Rotary Club and a past district governor. I was prospected to Rotary at a business expo by a, a gentleman that was walking the floor and asking everybody two questions. What is your name, and where do you live? And I happen to live in an area where a new Rotary Club is being formed, and he said, perfect. I'd like to come to Rotary next Tuesday at 7.30 in the morning and let you see what it's all about. I walked into the room, I saw a number of community people looking to solve the problems in that community and to also resolve polio. This was in 2001. I said, why not? This is also in Baltimore, Maryland. And I said, why not? I'll join. And uh, in 2006, when I relocated to the Charlotte area and knew absolutely no one in Charlotte, not one person, I immediately found the closest Rotary Club to me, joined that club, and I now have over 3,000 contacts, all because of Rotary. So I joined Rotary because I was prospected. I stayed because of the fellowship and the great service work that we do. And I can't say enough great things about this organization. It is the greatest service organization on the face of the earth. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Jane Dyer, and I am a pilot for FedEx, so I can fly all over the world. And luckily on one of my trips, I was flying with a, a gentleman and telling him that I was getting close to retirement and I was so looking forward to being able to do something for my community. And it just so happened that this gentleman was a vegetarian and he loved it and he sold me on it in no time. And then just a few weeks later, I was in Sunday school and um, someone said, hey, here's a Rotarian. And one of my Sunday school members was. And so afterwards, we talked about Rotary and so here I am. Uh, my name is Pete Lohr. Um, we're fairly new to Greenville, been here uh, about two years. Um, I've worked internationally and have done a lot of projects domestically, but it seems everywhere I go, I've run into one or two Rotarians. Um, it varies from 10 to 20, 25 years. So, um, when moving here, I've never been a Rotary member, but I know quite a few people who are. So, when we moved here, I thought it would be a great source to start networking and meet people in the area. And so this is the reason I'm at the discovery. Great. Um, I understand it's a lot more than just that, but it's about as much as I know besides what's on the website. So thank you. Okay, everybody. <laughs> this was critically important. Each of the returnees got to give a nice, compact snippet testimony. And each of the prospects told us how to sell them. Right? Each of the prospects told us why they were here, what they were looking for, and what they were interested in. Now, in a, in a live scenario, I'd be writing, and I'll just give you some of the tips and tricks. I take a sheet of paper that has the list on it from, uh, from our um, registration. I lay it out in the same orientation as the table, and I write the first names around the perimeter in their positions on the table. Because I can't remember everybody's name. These are guests, they're not going to have name tags on when they come in to discover Rotary. Now, I know who the members are, of course. So write those names around the perimeter and just make those kinds of notes. You know, airplane pilot heard about Rotary over the middle of the Pacific. Um, <laughs> degree, looking for a place to connect. So I write the names, the first names, so that, so that I can address them as individuals during the meeting. Because my memory is not all that good, maybe yours is. But I typically can't remember the names of eight or ten people around the table unless I have a on a piece of paper. So I do it in a map that looks just like the table. <clears throat> okay, well, let's hear a little bit about Rotary. First of all, let's talk about Rotary as an organization. We're an international network of business and professionals. We provide humanitarian service, we encourage high ethical standards in our vocations, which is a unique part of Rotary that we'll spend a little more time on. Uh, we build goodwill and peace in the world. We do that through one and a quarter million members and 35,000 clubs in over 200 countries. Our motto is service above self. That motto didn't originate with the founding of Rotary, but it came along several years later and it's adopted as an international uh, motto. This is an interesting uh, code of conduct or code of ethics. We call it the four-way test. And the four-way test was invented by a Rotary, not for Rotary. The four-way test was invented by a Rotarian who had been hired to turn around a failing company. And what he realized was part of his company's failure was the lack of any kind of ethical compass 
So he came up with these four points. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? He said, that's the way we want to treat our fellow employees, our customers, and our suppliers. Rotary picked up on it a few years later. It was presented at an international convention and then adopted as a standard, shall we say, code of conduct among the charities. First Rotary Club was started in Chicago in 1905. It was started by an attorney, actually, named Paul Harris. And uh, Paul started this for relatively selfish reasons. Paul was a young attorney. He'd grown up in the farm country of Illinois, actually born in the Northeast. And uh, recently minted attorney, he finds himself in the downtown area we now call the Loop of Chicago. Besides being snowy and cold, it wasn't the friendliest place in the world. So Paul needed his friends. So he went door to door, found some folks, thought they might be interested in getting together. And it really started out as kind of a little sort of a business club, leads club, networking club, if you will. Um, through maybe sometimes, maybe it's better to be lucky than good. <clears throat> what happened there, the folklore is this, at least the way I've, I've heard it. Uh, one of the members came in one day late, and he's taking off his big overcoat and his hat and everything, and brushing off the snow. And uh, his excuse was that he'd been on his way to a meeting, needed a restroom, and had to dash in and out of four or five buildings before he could find an available restroom. And they said, you know, we ought to have <clears throat> just a public photo a comfort station in downtown Chicago for the men's and the women's. So uh, they did this in negotiation with City Hall and literally built a running water um, public toilet, an extension out of the side of City Hall using their utilities and so forth. That was the first project that was through. And what happened then, the lucky part, is then all of a sudden this group had a reason for being that was bigger than that. <clears throat> As just a business association leads group that might have lasted five or ten years in South Carolina Park. But with this service component to it, that provided a reason for being and a whole lot more durability. And Rotarians have over time become that kind of people of action. People would see a problem, figure out a solution, get it done, including funding. We still do that today. Our club, the Rotary Club of Greenville, was founded in 1916, not that long after Rotary was founded. Uh, we were club number 205. There were already clubs uh, across the uh, northern uh, tier of states, a couple in Canada. There was a northern one in California. We were sponsored by the Rotary Club of Atlanta. And that was because some Greenville city leaders thought that they needed a community service club. They heard about this Rotary Club. <coughs> actually got on the train and rode down to Atlanta to experience a Rotary meeting and talk with the Atlanta Rotarians, who shortly sponsored them. And then uh, very short, that same year, actually uh, also sponsored the Columbia Club in uh, South Carolina. So we're the largest and the oldest of the 53 clubs in this half of the state. Greenville Rotarians, simply stated, built Greenville. Greenville Rotarians, over time, had been absolutely pivotal in the growth of this community. And that started with an early event, which was called the uh, International Textile Show. And what happened was there were people in the textile business and textile equipment business in Greenville, and they thought, gee, wouldn't it be great if we had a trade show and invite equipment manufacturers from all over the world and invite textile uh, mills from all over the world to come see this, uh, see this show. It was wildly successful. It was held in an old warehouse. And it was absolutely amazing. They finished up this thing and said, we got to do this again. we got to have a place to do it. So the Rotary Club of Greenville built what was first known as Textile Hall, which was an expo center, forerunner of places that we have those kind of meetings today, no longer standing. So they built Textile Hall, and that was the home of the Southern Textile Exposition that really put Greenville on the map as the textile capital of the uh, United States and of the South. A Furman's original gymnasium, again, Furman University was trying to recruit a president. This is in the early 1900s. And the president came to town, and of course, it only made sense for him to meet with the leadership of Greenville, who happened to be the Greenville Rotary Club. And he was kind of he was kind of hanging back. And finally, somebody said, Well, what do you need here? He said, Well, you know, you, you, a college really needs some kind of athletic program. You don't have any facilities, you don't have any fields, you don't have a field house, you don't have to play basketball. They said, how about if we build you one? Well, that might do it. 
So Gringo Rotary rose, raised sixty of eighty thousand dollars to build the first gym for Furman, and then later later built the football field. Uh, Rotary Lake at Camp Greenville, same deal, in partnership with the YMCA. Again, a, a legendary YMCA director was a member of the club, and we built essentially a summer camp out in the, on the foothills north of Greenville, still standing today. Uh, camp Sabir, you may know, was one of the largest training bases in World War I. It was just north and east of Greenville, up Fort Taylor's, and uh, Camp Sabir was engineered by a Rotary, actually, there's a group of Rotarians that visited the War Department that convinced the War Department to put Camp Sevier in Greenville. <clears throat> then it was, of course, a Rotarian engineering firm that designed it, a Rotarian engineering firm that built it, and during the influenza epidemic, it was actually brought back from Europe. Um, Rotarians provided a whole lot of just literally hands-on nursing services to keep Camp Sevier running in the middle of that epidemic. And then some of you may have heard of the Greenville Corral, where we're performing again with the Greenville Symphony this season. But um, it's been a durable organization. You might not know that it started as the Rotary Corral, the Rotary Civic Corral. Uh, Rotary Civic Corral actually performed at a um, international convention in Atlantic City. And like many things in Rotary, we handed this off then to another organization that was willing to take it and sustain it over time. So we're not in everything we do forever. <clears throat> there are several ways that we serve our Rotary Club, and one of them is in this context of what we call club service. As you might expect for events like this and the meeting we are about to attend with you know, 150 of our, uh, our friends, there's a lot of moving parts to that. So we have some committees that are simply, you might think of them as overhead. We have some committees that simply run the club. That includes checking in, that includes uh, managing the check-in table, uh, taking, uh, taking meal receipts at the door, planning the meeting, sergeants at arms, people directing you to your seat, planning the program, all that's taken together by the Club Service Committee. Then there's the Vocational Service Committee, which is really unique, and I think that'll make more sense in terms of projects. But our theory as Rotarians is that part of our role in serving our community is to do that through our skills and talents and know-how that we've developed as business people. So that's what vocational service is about, translating your business know-how into community service. Then there's our core responsibility, which is serving our community, making Greenville and other parts of the world a better place to live. International <coughs> service is the other parts of the world part of that. So through our international foundation, we also do work uh, in other countries, and I'll put in a little bit more on that. Then the youth service area, of course, is where we provide services to people not yet aged into the um, age bracket for Rotarians. Those would be primarily uh, middle school, high school, and college students. Let's talk about um, club service first. We have a fellowship outing once a year. It's a, a large event, uh, which is a family of uh, couples, guests, and so forth. Some of you may have attended one of those. Um, we also, of course, um, have our club meetings on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. That all comes under the area of club service. Vocational service best describes itself in terms of projects. Our vocational service efforts are these. First of all, a Teacher of the Year Award. We originated the Greenville County Teacher of the Year Award, and to this day, we still manage it. We take the applications, a team of Rotarians actually um, sifts through the applications, and then actually visits classrooms of the finalists. So we pick a teacher of the year and three runners up. We, of course, provide them some recognition. Local news is there at that meeting where we hand out not only the certificates, but also we get them to check. And the <coughs> classroom teachers spend a significant amount of their own money in most cases, funding things that are needed in their classroom. So we try to help out with that. And it's funny how things work. The year I was president, I got a nice thank you note back from the teacher of the year. And she said, Mr. Weaver, it was great to be uh, a guest at the Rotary Club meeting. I really appreciate the recognition and so much appreciate the check. But the best part was having lunch with adults. <laughs> <laughs> you just never know what's going to resonate. <laughs> Career day. This, this is a great thing that our club did for a long time called Shadowing Day. Now, who's familiar with job shadowing? Okay. 
Everybody understands job shadowing. And we were doing that, but we could only we could only support about 40 students with the number of members that we can get to, to uh, volunteer as shadow hosts. A few years ago, a brilliant idea came across, and part of this is because you know the economy is more from people doing things with their hands into more of a knowledge economy. Okay? And you know, it, for our members that are attorneys, for example, it doesn't sound like that much fun to tell high school students, hey, why don't you come over to my office this afternoon and watch me sue somebody? <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally have never had work that was fun to watch. Okay? But what we did is we put together a roundtable career cluster strategy, and we put Rotarians around each of those tables. We had one for engineering and construction. We had one for finance. We had one for healthcare. We had, had one for technology, uh, the arts, et cetera. And so we pulled the students in terms of their interests. We got members to volunteer. And this is one of those round tables. Russ Miller, uh, facing you there, is one of our financial services members. And so he was talking to students about careers in those areas. We had him for an hour and a half, folks, <clears throat> talking to top high school students, just answering their questions about a presumed career of interest. It was awesome. And we were able to support over 100 students, not to support them. We did send a group off to do conventional shadowing, and then this group stayed behind these round tables. Law enforcement, this law day, again, was an outgrowth of the Rotary Club of Greenville. Once upon a time, the city police chief, who was a member, said, you know, we ought to be able to recognize a police officer of the year. And of course, back then, police officers were even, uh, they were maybe more uh, heroes than they are today, uh, largely on the time for the moment. And that got expanded then when the county, when the, uh, county sheriff, also a member, said, hey, maybe you could include us. And then our, the third leg of that was federal agencies. So we named an officer of the year from the county sheriff's department, city police department, and a federal agency. And that could be FBI, ATF, uh, Homeland Security, etc. Just one of the federal agencies. It's also a nice, safe place to be that day. At least 30 people in the back carry on heat. This is a project we're just uh, launching this year. It's called Rotary Business Mentors. And the idea there is to provide hands on mentorship to people who would like to be able to start businesses that maybe had neither the wherewithal, the means, nor the know how. We've got a lot of people that know how to start their own businesses. So we're working with a couple of micro lending agencies locally to put mentors with those candidates that are trying to get businesses up and off the ground. Classic vocational service. Let's talk about um, a fundraising activity to support all that is our Centennial Golf Tournament. We, of course, raise the funds <coughs> that are necessary to support the projects that we do. Looking at community service then, here's a popular one, folks, as you know, in the state of South Carolina, 25% of our uh, citizens can't be newspaper. There's a lot to do with literacy, and it starts in the early classrooms. So we send Rotarians into classrooms, the typically uh, pre K classrooms in disadvantaged communities, and they read with the kids. And it's absolutely incredible. They're, they're particularly, I gotta say, they're particularly partial to men because in most of their households, they're like zero male role models. Now, my friend Ralph over here, Ralph would walk through fire to get to his once a month, one hour uh, reading uh, assignment on one of his career because he simply, simply loves doing it. Kids recognize him, come up and hug him around the leg, and he's even fabricated some oversized books so that he can talk to the kids. It's, it's a remarkable program, been doing it for years. And uh, as an aside, I have to say that this program was started by one Rotarian who's here today, and that's Sarah Mansbach. Sarah? Where stand up? I was at the Rotary meeting where Sarah started this when I believe George Fletcher was present. Is that right? We've got, the, we've got the cookbook. Thank you. Our Veterans Mentor Project is a little bit different. Um, and I didn't understand this at first. It, it turns out, as you know, most of our military is staffed by young people, always has been. And many of those people are right out of high school going to the military for two, four, maybe six years. And they exit the military 
and find themselves in kind of an unusual situation. They look like adults. But the fact is that their parents were taken care of for the first 18 years of their life. The military kind of looked after them for the next two, four, or six. They really haven't developed a lot of the skills necessary for life as a civilian. We didn't get that. A partner organization explained to us that situation, and we said, we've got those mentors. We've got ex-military, and you don't even have to be ex-military, to help somebody navigate you know, everyday life in America as, as a private citizen. So a great project, and uh, it's been a real help to returning vets, particularly those uh, younger age ones. We have a long-standing relationship with the Greenville Literacy Association. We do projects with them all the time, including volunteer mentors to help people learn to uh, either read, they can't read, or to learn, learn English as a second language. We also provide some funding for some uh, supplies. And one of those things is GED sponsorships. As you may know, uh, GED now has a pretty hefty price tag to it. So it's not only that you got to study up and get proficient enough to pass the GED, you've also got to come up with 160 bucks to take it. And that's a showstopper for a lot of people. So we provide sponsorships, we provide scholarships to fund those GED students that made their way to us referred to Greenville Literacy. This is a remarkable project. This is one of our international service projects, happens to be in Haiti, and it's called Partners in Agriculture. It was actually started by a Rotarian's spouse. She had been hired to teach uh, English in, I'm, I'm sorry, to teach French in Haiti. She was fluent in French, native English speaker, and she got down there and she looked around and she saw all these malnourished kids running around. We're in a tropical climate up in the central plateau of Haiti. All you have to do is push a seed into the ground and it'll grow. Now this woman happened to be an, an Australian farmer by birth. She looked around she said, we've got kids with not enough to eat and nobody's growing anything. What's that about? So she set about, dropped the, dropped the uh, French teaching thing entirely, and set about starting to help the Haitians learn to farm. And I've heard that, i thought about it, and I said, well, you know, that makes some sense. Farming is not a native instinct to humans. Hunting and gathering is the native instinct of humans. You have to learn to farm. It's a developed skill. No one ever taught Haitians to do that. So Ghislaine started working on that, and then was joined, as this always happens, was joined by one of the international humanitarian associations of, of, of the planet uh, called Partners in Health, a guy named Paul Farmer. And Partners in Health saw this situation. They had learned to grow peanuts in Haiti. And you know kids will eat peanut butter, right? <coughs> Think about it. Peanut butter's got almost everything you need in it to solve that for the cure for malnutrition. We call it food. So the Partners in Health organization figured out a way to roast peanuts, grind peanuts up into peanut butter. We add some vitamins and we add some powdered milk as a supplement. And now we uh, package it in like a squeezy applesauce type container. And four to six weeks of a kid whose ribs you can see through his, uh, through his chest, four to six weeks on this, uh, it's called Murray Mamba. Um, they're off and running. They're, they're restored to normal health. Then, Abbott Labs in Chicago heard about this and said, we'd like to help out with that. Big pharmaceutical companies do this kind of thing all over the world. They built a state-of-the-art FDA class factory right behind our vocational school in Haiti, right on the farm where we're teaching uh, these skills. And it's, it's a metal building, um, steel construction, rigid conduit, concrete floor, stainless steel equipment. It's like any food plant of the United States just walked out and had trans, there's no building like it in Haiti. I mean, this thing's unbelievable. And so in that building now, they run a five-day shift of roasting peanuts on Monday, processing Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They're shipping this stuff all over the world from this little factory in Haiti. It's entirely the result of this project. Now, the other thing it does is it provides the Haitian farmers with an outlet for their product, peanuts, and it provides some Haitians with some work besides solving an international uh, food crisis. Clean water, we use some of the uh, most interesting things as a district uh, down in Central America. 
and we focused most of our efforts on Central America and, uh, uh, and the Caribbean. And there's a reason for that. First of all, it's close, we can get there easily. Not a big language barrier, English to Spanish. And of course, there's no jet lag, there's no time zone change. So it's easy to stay in touch with these communities. And uh, this is an uh, example of one of our clean water projects. What we do is we go up in the mountains in the uh, central uh, section of Honduras. We find a mountain stream that runs year round, a spring that runs year round. We check that in the dry season, make sure it provides enough water. And then we pipe that down to a ground level storage tank on a side hill, and then pipe that down to one spigot per household in a village. So all of a sudden, people that had been drinking contaminated water, and as you probably know, the majority of children that do not survive between childhood and adulthood, better than half of those are taken out by waterborne diseases. So when you solve that water problem, it just completely changes the complexion of a village. And we've done this in countless villages, up to about a dozen now. Uh, we're working on a huge project now that is uh, over $100,000 and will actually serve three communities on <coughs> one huge water source. Our youth service efforts are with what we call Rotaract, and that is with uh, young adults, with Interact is with uh, middle school and high school. And we also have a project called Early Act First Night. And Early Act First Night is a character uh, training program. You wouldn't think we have to teach character in school, but today that's the fact. And uh, what we do is we go into a school, it's built around the uh, Knights of the Round Table and uh, chivalry and honor, the honor code of the, uh, of the medieval knights. And so they have these knighting ceremonies. The kids eat this up. Why joust with horses? It's unbelievable. So they go into homeroom every day, they recite the four-way test, and then for a month, they work on a particular word related to character, honesty, for example. And uh, completely changes the complexion of the Our Rotary Foundation is our international funding source for all of this. And so the way that works is we as Rotarians contribute to this foundation. Then when a Rotarian anywhere in the world, not just South Carolina, but in Haiti or Honduras says, I found a problem here. I've got a solution for it, but I can't come up with all the money. Would you help? Rotary Foundation then funds these kinds of projects I talked about. Almost every project I've listed today has received, at one point or another, funding from the Rotary Foundation. And that's, of course, how we do these uh, big projects uh, like the farm in Haiti and like the uh, water projects in Guatemala and Honduras. So it was launched uh, in 1985. I'm sorry, I'm going to tell you about our uh, flagship project of the Rotary Foundation, which is the eradication of polio. Uh, polio, as you know, has not been present in the United States since about 1972, <coughs> but it's still alive and well in the world, although only in two countries. Um, polio in 1985, when we started this, uh, was striking 1,000 people a day, 350,000 people a year got polio somewhere in the world in 1985. This past year, 2017, 15, one five, 15 people in the world got polio. That is a result of a 30 plus year effort of Rotary and its partners, CDC, UNICEF, and the World Health Organization. So we make these humanitarian grants for, again, projects that fit the model of what we're trying to do. We provide those as educational programs, as health and hunger and uh, training programs and so forth. And our Rotary Foundation was named the World's Outstanding Foundation for 2016 by its trade association. Most of the reason for that, all the fundraising is volunteer. All the fundraising is by Rotarians and through Rotarians. But the best part, folks, that's the way the money gets spent, too. <coughs> Nothing moves the Rotary Foundation until a Rotarian and a Rotary Club says, I got a problem, I got a solution, and I need some funding to help. We don't send money to foreign governments, we don't send money to big you know, global programs, we fund things that Rotarians come up with. So why would you want to do this? Hey, your reasons may vary. You might be interested in networking, you might be interested in community service, you might be interested in simply getting more engaged in your community, feeling good about doing good things in the world, a lot of possible reasons. You'll have to pick out your own for yourself. 
This wouldn't be complete without talking about the money. So let me be clear with you about the money. And what you recognize first is that most of the cost of joining our Rotary Club, the belonging to our Rotary Club, is the meals. That's true of most clubs. So our meals are twice a month at a nice downtown venue, including parking, cost $126 a quarter. We ask you to make a contribution to the Rotary Foundation to help fund these things at the rate of $25 a quarter. And then there's a once a year dues of 188 and our scholarship fund of $50. So we typically bill this annually. That's where our club's been in business for 100 years. We bill this annually, but we will accommodate you to pay by credit card on a quarterly basis according to this, uh, according to this chart. Now, to mention also that all of the stuff is prorated to July 1st. So joining at this time of the year, of course, uh, those things in the first column and the first quarter column, you know, those, those will all be half. And of course, you're only on the hook for the uh, last couple of quarters of meals. I would mention that uh, we have a $150 one-time initiation fee. We waive that for people who have been in Rotary before. Been in Rotary before, we'll waive that, otherwise be a one-time $150 initiation fee. So that, that's the way, any questions about the money? Okay on that? I have a handout here that will include that as part of the back of it. So what would I do now? Well, if you're interested in joining us, it's really pretty simple. You're invited by a Rotary to become part of our club. You've been invited here today by that Rotary. So you pursue that to a complete application with two signatures, your primary sponsor, perhaps one of us, or somebody else that you know in the club is a secondary sponsor. We approve that in our board. We do that once a month at our uh, monthly board meeting. And then you become a member and you start in the process of getting appointed, which begins with a new member orientation, setting up your contact information in our online database, attend as many meetings as possible at the regular meeting, but do some other things outside to where you have at least two rotary activities a month, like club meetings twice a month. And then we invite uh, new members to be a greeter at a lunch meeting, which gives you an opportunity to put some names and faces at the front door. Identify the things you're really passionate about and then get engaged with those committees. So that's really pretty much the whole drill. Uh, what I brought with me today for your convenience is a membership proposal form. You don't have to do anything with this today. There's no pressure here. But it, should you decide that you want to be a part of this club, it's a one pager with all the financial information on the back. You know exactly uh, what you're in for on the financial fronts. And of course, uh, I'll follow up with email and uh, electronic copy of this afterwards. So at this point, I'm going to ask you participants if you have any questions, or more importantly, for, there's some things you saw here today that were just surprising to you. I had no idea that there were so many things that Rotary was involved with. And I think no matter what my passion is, I'll find something that I could be involved with. <coughs> but tell me this, I, I saw a quick little um, one slide, something about attendance. Now, you have to travel a lot with your job and you can't make every meeting. What happens? Do you get an nasty email? Or? Good question. Good question. Attendance really, is, is, is not a hard, fast requirement, but rather a metric of engagement. What we're looking for is engaged Rotarians that are doing Rotary-related activities, whether you can make it to the meetings or not. If you can make the meetings, great. You also have the opportunity to visit any other Rotary club in the world, let alone one of the 11 clubs in Greenville County. So if it doesn't happen, if you're here on a Tuesday, there are clubs that meet Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, morning, noon, and night, so you can get acquainted with Rotarians outside the Greenville Club uh, by that means. But we do count as meeting attendance any activity relating to Rotary, such as serving on a committee or working on a project. And again, we're, looking, we're talking about two to one is the metric for our club. Could you uh, explain a little bit more about getting sponsors? You're new to an area mm -hmm. about a Rotary you may not know a Rotary member in the area. How that would work out is just stick right after the meeting and we've got more than one member here that'd be happy to talk with you about a potential sponsor. 
Um, what I know of Rotary has been my dad was a Rotary many, many, many years ago. So, of course, I'm a big um, person about diversity. So, is there opportunity for everybody in Rotary, or is this still kind of a my dad expressed Rotary? <laughs> Thankfully, Rotary came to its senses in the 80s and began uh, admitting women members, which was a, a huge thing because, frankly, it's, it's changed the complexion of the club. It's also changed the complexion of the, of the leadership. We've been in a large club like ours, we've had members and presidents, and then the next tier above that is what we call district governors. We've had numerous women district governor governors, and in fact, two in the line to become uh, governors. Uh, we haven't done as well as we'd like in terms of, for example, ethnic minorities. That's just a hard face to reach, but we're, we're working on it. Jane, if you're, if you're interested in that, and diversity is a big thing, we have a committee. We have a diversity committee at the Green Club. So uh, we would welcome you to join that. I think you could add a lot to this. Well, thank you for your attendance today. I invite you to stick around for the meeting, which is just up the stairs in the little ballroom. And uh, you know, do stay in touch with your sponsor. Bring any questions that you have through them. You're welcome to contact me anytime. And thanks for joining us today. <laughs>